Hello and welcome to this Canadian Bar Association podcast. Sexual harassment and sexual assault are happening throughout Canada. Recent high-profile cases and media stories involving Gian Gomeshi, Bill Cosby, the CBC, Canadian Parliament, and various universities and sports franchises have brought the far-reaching implications of sexual harassment and sexual assault into clear view for many Canadians. Sexual harassment and sexual assault are complex problems, not only in our legal system, but in our, in our communities as, as a whole. Finding solutions means gaining a deeper understanding of the legalities, as well as how society as a whole contributes at a foundational level. This podcast is being presented by the following sections of the Canadian Bar Association, Women's Lawyers Forum, the Equality Committee, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Forum, the Canadian Corporate Council Association, the Military Law Section, the Labor and Employment Law Section, and the Civil Litigation Section. In 2014, the Women Lawyers Forum began the hashtag Right Your Wrong campaign, where we asked Canadian lawyers to tell their stories involving sexual harassment and sexual assault. We received 47 submissions that describe experiences ranging from hearing inappropriate jokes to being physically assaulted. It is from these stories that we come to you today with this podcast. My name is Heidi Shedler, and I am the first co-chair of the Canadian Bar Association's Women Lawyers Forum. I am joined by four very esteemed speakers. Gail Gachalian is a lawyer and workplace investigator at Pink Larkin in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She is also the chair of the National Labor and Employment Law Section of the Canadian Bar Association. Dr. Harry Stefanakis is a psychologist and educator in Vancouver, British Columbia. Dr. Stefanakis is an active participant in programs seeking to end violence in relationships and workplaces, and he has appeared in the video titled, Men Speaking Up, Ending Violence Together. Tracy Porteous is the Executive Director of the Ending Violence Association of British Columbia and Co-Chair of the Ending Violence Association of Canada. Tracy has been involved in developing programs and policy that respond to violence against women for 35 years one example being the More Than a Bystander program. And finally, Angus Reid is a former award-winning offensive lineman who played in the Canadian Football League for the BC Lions. Angus became a bystander spokesman very early on, traveling across British Columbia, talking to youth and communities about the importance of speaking out against violence and abuse towards women. Welcome to all of our speakers. There are three general topics that I would like to discuss today. First, What do sexual assault and sexual harassment mean legally? Second, why do sexual assault and sexual harassment happen in the first place? And third, what can we, as lawyers, as clients, as citizens, and as a community, do to fix this problem? Gail, perhaps we can start with the legal side of things. Most people think of sexual harassment and sexual assault as being criminal, period. Certainly they can be, but sexual harassment and sexual assault reach far beyond the criminal law. They create complex and challenging issues that touch upon our everyday lives, our work, our employment, the services that Canadian businesses provide to the public, the jobs we have, and how we manage our companies and workforces. Perhaps you could begin by giving us an outline of what laws are in place to deal with sexual sexual harassment and sexual assault in the context of our quote-unquote working lives and the services that employers provide to their customers. Sure, Heidi. Um, I think there are five principal ways that sexual harassment and sexual assault is regulated in the workplace, and I'm not talking about criminal law, so I'm talking about workplace law. Uh, So first, uh, we have human rights legislation. Uh, That type of legislation prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in employment, and this includes a prohibition against sexual harassment in employment. Human rights statutes don't specifically refer to sexual assault, but uh, sexual assault falls within the meaning of sexual harassment. It can certainly be other things. Uh, uh, It can be a criminal offense uh, or a standalone reason for termination uh, with cause, but it also falls within the definition of sexual harassment. Um, It's also important to point out that sexual harassment Uh, often does overlap with harassment on the basis of other protected grounds, such as gender identity and gender expression. Uh, The second type of legal regulation of sexual harassment uh, and assault is in the form of occupational health and safety legislation, uh, which imposes on employers the obligation to take all reasonable measures to provide a safe workplace. 
which includes a workplace free of violence, and this would, in my view, include sexual violence. Um, some of these statutes have uh, specific violence in the workplace regulations that go beyond the general provisions for safe workplace, um, and those type of regulations require employers to conduct uh, workplace violence assessments and, if needed, to have workplace violence prevention plans. Uh, some jurisdictions uh, have occupational health and safety legislation that specifically addresses harassment. Uh, and this year, Ontario's uh, Act was amended to specifically refer to sexual harassment. Um, thirdly, uh, unionized workplaces uh, have uh, collective agreements that um, employees can grieve under if they've been subject to sexual harassment in the workplace. Uh, fourth, for non-unionized employees, we have the common law. So you can't sue for uh, sexual harassment um, alone, except perhaps in Manitoba. But generally speaking, the Supreme Court of Canada has said that uh, those types of claims are within the exclusive jurisdiction of human rights uh, legal regimes. But an employee can claim damages for sexual harassment as part of a wrongful dismissal action, as part of an action for constructive dismissal, or uh, as forming the factual basis for the tort of negligent or intentional infliction of mental suffering. Uh, finally, we've recently seen specific legislation requiring colleges and universities uh, to have policies and procedures to respond to complaints by students of sexual misconduct and sexual violence on campus. You know, it's interesting, Gail, you made reference in your comments uh, to the word workforce and workplace quite uh, quite consistently. And I'm sure that many people think that that word workplace means the four walls of an office or at least some very cl clear and distinct space that they work in. Maybe you could take a moment and explain what is a workplace and does it include volunteer organizations? Sure. So the workplace certainly is not uh, necessarily confined to the four walls of an office or a building. Uh, it can extend to work-related events outside of the workplace, for example, social events or training. Um, uh, this year, there was an arbitration decision out of Ontario that upheld the termination of an employee for sexual harassment that took place at a social event off-site. Um, the workplace may also extend to online behavior that impacts the workplace, for example, posts on Facebook. Um, the Ontario Human Rights Commission has said that the human rights code there may apply to workplace-related postings on the internet. Um, as, far as far as volunteers go, um, if, you're, if the human rights legislation that you're looking at uh, doesn't specifically address um, volunteer public service as the Act does in Nova Scotia, then uh, you may be limited to uh, making an argument that uh, it falls under discrimination or harassment in employment. And then the question is going to be, uh, does the volunteer rate relationship meet the definition of employment? We can get some guidance for the factors that a tribunal would look at from a 2002 British Columbia Human Rights uh, Tribunal decision that looked at things such as um, is the fact that the organization at issue there was a collective of volunteers and paid staff. Uh, the work done by volunteers was essential to fulfilling the organization's mandate. Um, and uh, volunteers underwent screening and an extensive training program. So in that case, those factors were relied on to find that the volunteer relationship was really uh, fell within the definition of employment. Um, another uh, as, uh, aspect of uh, uh, the issue of workplace uh, people should be aware of is that uh, law partners and other partners uh, in a professional partnership may not be considered to be employees under human rights legislation. Um, and uh, for further guidance on this, you could look at the Supreme Court of Canada case from 2014 where an equity partner in a law firm um, was found not to have uh, the right to file a complaint of discrimination on the basis of age. Um, the court applied a control and dependency test in that case, but that doesn't mean that a partner in a law firm doesn't have any recourse. Uh, for example, the Nova Scotia Code of Ethics for Lawyers um, requires lawyers to, or it states uh, that law a lawyer must not sexually harass any person a lawyer must not discriminate against any person, 
uh, and uh, Alora has a special responsibility to respect the requirements of human rights. So uh, uh, even though a partner in law firm might not be considered to be an employee, um, the, the regulator might be able to address the situation. Well, it certainly seems like there's a very wide spectrum of laws that apply to help protect people as it relates to sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, and I'm sure, Gail, you could talk for days on any one of those pieces. Um, you know, and, and, and I appreciate, too, that even the context and d definition of what is a workplace is also it can be considered quite broad. And that is really helpful to give us a little bit of context around that. Perhaps now we can move to talking a little bit about the legal definition of sexual assault and sexual harassment. What, what, how does the law define those actions? Yeah, so uh, some human rights statutes provide a definition of sexual harassment, some don't. Um, but the leading definition is from a 1989 Supreme Court of Canada uh, case uh, the judgment written, written by then Chief Justice Dixon and Jansen and Platty Enterprises, and he defined a sexual harassment as unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature that detrimentally affects the work environment or leads to adverse job-related consequences to the victims of the harassment. Um, and I think it's important to remember what Chief Justice Dixon said in that case about sexual harassment being an abuse of power. He said it is um, uh, and has been widely accepted, and this is back in 1989, uh, as an abuse of power. When sexual harassment occurs in the workplace, it is an abuse of both economic and sexual power. Um, another important concept to keep in mind is that sexual harassment includes uh, gender-based harassment, which the Ontario Human Rights Commission defines as behavior that seeks to enforce traditional heterosexual gender norms uh, and includes harassment for gender nonconformity. Um, uh, three other points that are important to uh, keep in mind when uh, thinking about what constitutes sexual harassment are these. One, intention is not a necessary element of sexual harassment. Uh, two, the behavior doesn't have to be directed at any one person. So sexual harassment includes conduct that creates a hostile or poison environment. And three, um, a person may be more vulnerable to sexual harassment if they identify by other protected grounds, such as gender identity and gender expression. Um, so that's human rights legislation. Um, when we're thinking about what uh, meets the definition of sexual harassment in occupational health and safety legislation, um, for the legislation uh, that only refers to violence, uh, it may be that uh, well, certainly sexual violence would uh, fall under that definition, but based on a Federal Court of Appeal uh, decision in 2014 involving PSAC, um, uh, upholding a Federal Court uh, uh, decision, uh, decided that the definition of violence in the Federal Occupational Health and Safety Legislation, the Canada Labor Code Part 2, may be broad enough to cover harassment that may cause mental or psychological harm or illness. Now, Ontario, as I referred to before, uh, has a specific definition of sexual harassment in uh, Bill 132. That's all very interesting. I mentioned at the beginning that you also, not only are you a lawyer, but you're also a workplace investigator. How, how would a workplace investigator such as yourself or any other workplace investigator determine whether a person's behavior meets the definition of sexual harassment? So, um, you look for uh, the, the elements, whether the elements of the, the, the definition are, are met, that is, uh, was there a course of conduct uh, or one instance of egregious conduct? Uh, secondly, was the conduct of a sexual nature? And that includes the concept, like I said, of reinforcing traditional uh, gender stereotypes. And third, was the conduct known or should it ought, or ought reasonably known to be unwelcome, meaning either the, the alleged uh, perpetrator knew or he or she should have known that the conduct was unwelcome. And uh, there are lots of sources for examples uh, of uh, what constitutes sexual or gender-based harassment. For example, the Ontario Human Rights Commission has a policy on preventing sexual harassment and gender-based harassment and gives uh, a list of examples such as 
demanding hugs, making unnecessary physical content, uh, sorry, contact, uh, making gender-related comments about someone's physical characteristics or mannerism, uh, showing or sending pornography, sexual pictures, sexual jokes, and so on. Um, there's no shortage of cases uh, that detail instances of sexual harassment. Uh, just a couple of examples here in Nova Scotia. Uh, Nova Scotia Human Rights Board of Inquiry in a case called Sheer Logic uh, found an owner of a hair salon to have engaged in sexual harassment uh, when he said things like uh, the following to his employee, the complainant, things like she could not be gay because she was pretty, uh, asking her uh, about whether she wore a one-piece or a two-piece bathing suit, um, calling her uh, um, bipolar lesbian and a bitch, excuse the language. But these are the types of things that happen quite often in workplaces and um, over and over again. Uh, a, a really egregious case of sexual harassment was the subject of a 2015 decision by the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario where the two complainants were temporary foreign workers um, from Mexico uh, working for Prestive, a fish processing plant in Ontario. And in that case, uh, the uh, two complainants were subject, subject to uh, conduct on the part of the owner of that company, uh, such as uh, being invited out to dinner with him alone on many occasions, uh, despite uh, one of the complainants saying uh, she wasn't uh, interested, uh, the owner telling her many times that, uh, uh, and yelling at her, saying she essentially had no choice, uh, touching her inappropriately. Uh, uh, repeatedly and so on. Uh, so those are the types of examples, and there's no shortage of examples of uh, conduct that falls within the definition of sexual harassment. And certainly those are really egregious and uh, perhaps seemingly obvious examples of uh, sexual harassment and sexual assault. And I think it's important to keep in mind what you mentioned about this reasonable aspect to it. So what would a reasonable person, the average person standing on the street, if they were watching this, seeing it happen, would they be um, offended or would they consider this to be uh, reprehensible behavior? You know, and on that note, I think uh, it's important as well to talk about the obligations of an employer and what obligations exist for them as far as providing a safe place to work. So, um, uh, very simply, uh, an employer's obligation under human rights legislation is to provide a safe, harassment-free, discrimination-free workplace. And this includes uh, providing a workplace that is free from sexual harassment by supervisors and management, coworkers, but also clients and customers. Uh, and in the human rights context, um, decision makers look at what we call the Laskowska factors, it's from a case uh, called Laskowska, to determine um, whether an employer is liable for uh, the sexual harassment of an employee, and if so, the extent of that liability. And those factors are as follows. One, um, education uh, policies and prevention uh, were those proactive uh, measures in place. Two, appropriate complaint handling. Uh, this would include taking care of the complainant uh, pending uh, the investigation and having a competent investigation take place. And the third Laskowska factor is, uh, was there a proper response by the employer uh, at the end of the investigation of the complaint. Um, and I can elaborate on uh, any one of those three factors if you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you made reference to um, an investigation. What What is required from an employer to conduct an investigation? Well, um, I think there are four, at least four essential elements of an adequate investigation, and they are as follows. Promptness impartiality, uh, a trained and experienced investigator, and procedural fairness. 
promptness is absolutely essential uh, in investigating and responding to a complaint of sexual harassment. Because if the harassment has actually taken place, the longer you wait to deal with it, the more of the potential harm, not only to the victim of the harassment, but uh, to the rest of the workplace who probably knows that it's been taking place. And the more the harm uh, to the credibility of the employer, if the employer isn't seen to be taking uh, complaints of sexual harassment uh, seriously and dealing with it um, expeditiously. Uh, impartiality uh, is crucial. That is, the investigator must both uh, have uh, be free from bias as well as be seen uh, to be impartial. This is important uh, first for ensuring as best as possible that the uh, decision that the employer will ultimately make will be based on an accurate understanding of the facts. Um, and secondly, uh, the impartiality of the investigation is really important, again, for the uh, credibility of the employer in the eyes of the workplace and ensuring that employees will feel comfortable in the future bringing forward allegations of sexual harassment uh, and will feel comfortable that the employer will adequately investigate and respond to complaints of sexual harassment. Um, the same goes for the factor of training and experience of the investigator. Um, uh, we also have to, employers have to worry about the potential liability uh, if the employer makes a decision that isn't based on an accurate uh, understanding of the flat facts. That liability could come from either uh, the um, complainant who feels that the employer hasn't responded adequately to his or her complaint of sexual harassment, or it could come from the respondent uh, who feels that the, um, he or she was either disciplined or terminated uh, unfairly or unjustly. And uh, the same um, reasons apply to the factor of procedural fairness. Um, employers have been criticized in, in various types of decisions for failing to provide the respondent uh, with procedural fairness in conducting the investigation uh, of a complaint. Um, and uh, one of the cases that's often referred to is an arbitration case called the City of Hamilton out of Ontario in 2013. Uh, in that case, a female employee was experiencing uh, ongoing sexual harassment by a male supervisor. She made several reports to management they appointed an internal investigator who only interviewed the two parties and didn't interview any of the relevant uh, witnesses. Um, and uh, during the investigation, another fault of the employer was that uh, it didn't take any steps to protect the complainant during the several months long investigation. And so she was required to con continue working under the harasser for that time. Uh, so promptness, impartiality, competent investigator and procedural fairness, I think, are essential elements of an investigation. And they all seem to be connected in some way, shape, or form in the sense that mm -hmm. you can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. um, you made reference in your comments to, um, and I'll paraphrase uh, here, to, to, to the employer taking responsibility for effectively protecting uh, or, or, or ensuring that nothing more happens to the complainant once a complaint has been lodged. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So, um, uh, obviously, the employer and whoever is assigned to investigate the complaint has to be impartial and unbiased and cannot make a determination without conducting a proper investigation, but uh, has to, the employer has to ensure that uh, the complainant is protected from any further potential harassment and also that the respondent is, is protected uh, from any uh, further allegations. And so that will sometimes require a separation of the parties to the complaint, uh, ideally uh, continuing to employ both of them. It might require a transfer. Uh, but if protection of the complainant, again, without making a determination of the outcome of the complaint, is only possible uh, by removing someone from the workplace, then that person has to be the, the respondent. Again, it should be a non-disciplinary administrative uh, uh, leave uh, and uh, all the more reason um, for ensuring that the investigation takes place expeditiously. It certainly seems like there's a, um, 
a high level, a high standard put in place for employers to ensure that the proper actions are taken when a complaint has been made. Maybe you could just take a quick moment to address the risks that would face an employer if they don't do what they should do. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think employers have to be concerned about the potential significant harm uh, that can uh, be experienced by victims of sexual harassment and sexual assault in the workplace. Uh, for example, in a 2013 arbitration case involving the city of Calgary and QP, um, a municipal clerk had been sexually harassed and assaulted by a foreman, and she was ultimately diagnosed uh, with acute stress, admitted to hospital with suicidal ideation, and as found by the arbitrator, she was eventually left totally disabled from working. Um, employers should also be very concerned about the fact that sexual harassment and assault poisons the entire workplace, and the costs associated with this could include um, decreased morale, productivity, and performance, increased absenteeism, and a really big hit uh, potentially to recruitment and retention as well as the organization's reputation. There's also the cost involved with legal proceedings. Uh, including the uh, cost of potential damages. So uh, in the Calgary case I just mentioned, general damages were assessed at $125,000. Loss of past income was awarded uh, in the amount of $135,000. And loss of future income was assessed at $500,000. Um, in a 2006 British uh, Columbia Court of Appeal case, uh, in Seoul to Minister of Public Safety, uh, the Court of Appeal upheld the lower court's award of $950,000 in damages to a female RCMP officer for the severe psychological harm she suffered from persistent harassment by the commander of her detachment. Uh, so the, this issue of sexual harassment in the RCMP is not a new one. Um, and uh, more recently, a case out of uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, this year in Strudwick and Applied Consumer and Cl Clinical Evaluations. This was a case of harassment on the basis of disability, get, but gives you a sense uh, uh, of what an employer might face in a case involving wrongful dismissal, uh, which involves harassment. In that case, the uh, plaintiff was awarded a total of about $250,000 in damages in her wrongful dismissal action. You know, perhaps I could be so bold as to compare uh, ignoring a complaint of this nature to ignoring a cancer in your body in the sense that it really could have such significant and serious impacts on how you move through the world and how your business continues to conduct everything it does, that it, it is something that you simply cannot ignore. Uh, you know, we... we uh, maybe I can ask you, Gail, to just sum up by giving us what you think would be you know, your your best piece of advice that you could give either to a complainant or to an employer, or both for that matter, if, if you'd like, as to how to handle this type of a situation, whether from the complainant perspective or from the employer perspective? Well, for complainants, my advice, I think, would be um, to, to complain and complain and, and make it known to the employer, to management in a formal right way, uh, in written form, um, what's happened to him or her. Now, um, we all recognize that often these cases involve a huge power imbalance, and often complainants are worried about what employment consequences uh, they might be able, may, may suffer as a result of complaining. Um, in these cases, uh, I would suggest that uh, uh, employees um, consult with uh, uh, an employment lawyer um, in the uh, uh, professions, uh, there's always somebody at the regulator you can talk to about these types of cases. For employers, uh, my advice is uh, when uh, an employer becomes aware, either through a complaint or not, uh, 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 if it becomes aware otherwise, about sexual harassment taking place in the workplace, it has to act now. It can't wait. Uh, there's so many examples of uh, cases high-profile cases where large institutions with lots of resources waited and waited until an enormous amount of damage was caused both to the victims as well as to the larger workplace. So don't wait. Um, act now. Uh, make sure that the investigation is done promptly and properly. 
But don't uh, lose sight of the fact that there are uh, opportunities in many cases to resolve the situation. I mean, except perhaps in cases involving uh, uh, conduct on the serious end of the spectrum. There may actually be some potential on the part of the respondent to reform uh, his or her behavior. Uh, so be alive to the fact that perhaps mediation can be used to um, um, repair what's happening in the workplace. And uh, finally, my advice to employers uh, would be don't wait for a complaint. Don't wait for a complaint to try and uh, ensure that the culture that you have in your workplace, the culture that you have in your organization is a healthy, respectful one, and start thinking seriously and, put it, and start putting some time and effort into building a respectful workplace so that uh, you don't have to re rely on the, the complaint investigation disciplinary model uh, when things um, um, get out of hand and uh, sexual harassment has already taken place. Thank you so much, Gail. I really appreciate all of your insights and comments. Um, with that legal foundation and knowledge, I'd now like to turn to Dr. Harry Stefanakis and talk about what I consider to be another foundational piece, which is why does this even happen in the first place? Dr. Stefanakis, through your work as a psychologist and an educator, you've worked directly with both victims and perpetrators of sexual harassment and sexual assault. Why do you think sexual harassment and sexual assault occur in our society? So first I'd like to echo something Gail said, which is we need to make it clear that sexual harassment is about power and it's not about sex. It's fundamentally a form of harassment in which the offending party is using gender, sex, and sexuality as a means for the harassment. Um, the use of harassment as a tactic of control explains why sexual harassment is most frequent in workplaces where women are new and are in the minority. In fact, no matter how many men they encounter in the course of their work, Women who hold jobs traditionally held by men are far more likely to be harassed than women who do what is considered traditional women's work. Mm. In fact, even men most likely to be victimized are men who deviate from traditional stereotypes of masculinity, whether they belong to a sexual minority or they're actively involved in feminist causes. One study demonstrated that backlash was particularly common against heterosexual men who challenged traditional gender roles. Employers and employees often expect men to act as masculine as possible, and anything that deviates from that role, well, that gets them harassed. For example, men who take time off work to take care of their children may experience more gender harassment in the workplace as a result. Now, there's no single cause or reason that we can identify for sexual harassment, but we can point to factors that in increase the likelihood of sexual harassment occurring in the workplace. And I'll talk about a few different kinds of factors, if you don't mind, uh, individual factors, Absolutely. societal factors and organizational factors. So from an individual perspective, again, there's no unitary kind of offender, They're, although offenders tend to be male. And this is true for both male and female victims. Male victims are equally likely to be harassed by males as they are by females. Uh, the offender is usually in, a, in the same or a higher position and usually from the dominant social group. Uh, importantly, people with traditional views of gender roles are more likely to blame the victim in case of sexual harassment and are more likely to harass themselves. The worst offenders, the ones who tend to repeat um, sexual harassment behavior even when they're told it's inappropriate, uh, they tend to be domineering and controlling individuals. Uh, they lack empathy, they're impulsive, and they're mostly constricted. Um, from a societal perspective, Again, you can see that sexual harassment really reflects women's economic inequality and uh, social inequality in society. And so, you know, changes in society in general will help reduce uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. There are some other factors as well. There are differences in perceptions between men and women that are important and that education might help. Uh, for example, um, in one study from the University of Arizona, found that 67% men said they would feel complimented if they were propositioned at work, uh, but only 17% of women said so. In another study, using scenarios of harassment showing a progression or escalation of harassment, most women would say that sexual harassment started at the very first lunch or meeting where the coworker asked about her private life instead of her work, whereas most men said that sexual harassment began at the point he tried to touch her. So these perception, perceptual differences can be 
uh, address through education. Um, from an organizational perspective, the strongest predictor for sexual harassment in the workplace is whether there's tolerance for it in the workplace. And this involves, say, the management taking the side of the senior person in all cases. Uh, if there's a lack of a workplace harassment policy, that's a huge predictor of harassment occurring in the workplace. Um, if there's a gender composition, especially among supervisors, that is dominated by males. And uh, some of the things that uh, Gail suggested as well, where there's uh, subtle and not so subtle uh, sort of tolerance in the environment, for example, by allowing pornography in the environment. Mm -hmm. um, one other factor that I'd like to point to is this uh, psychological factor that we call groupthink. Men in groups are more likely to support uh, or inadvertently condone acts of harassment uh, than when they are alone. And so men together need to also stand up and uh, speak out against uh, uh, sexual harassment. And as a group, they'll have a stronger voice. Because one of the biggest problems is, um, that sustains sexual harassment is silence. Women are often afraid, or the victims are often afraid, of coming forward for fear of further harassment. And um, men are often silent about what is happening in their environment. You know, it's interesting. That, uh, that that's very helpful, and it's interesting that that uh, you know you talk about the the impacts of the silence and and how it impacts the victims and how it can impact much broader than just the victim. And oftentimes we do think of sexual harassment and sexual assault as the victim only being the person, the target, the individual who was uh, you know pointed at and spoken to in that way. Um, but I get the impression that that the impact runs much deeper than that. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, of course. Uh, the impact affects everyone in the environment, of course. And again, it was uh, alluded to earlier that you create a toxic work environment that will have a broad range impact. But it also extends even farther than that. Uh, it'll have an impact on other individuals that are around the person who is being victimized. It can affect, for example, their parents, their friends, their partners, children, spouses, and of course their co-workers. And uh, they can also have a whole bunch of different uh, complex feelings and to make sense of what happened, and sometimes even making sense of the, of the fact that uh, they could not do it or they did not do anything or could not do anything to stop it. Uh, and so you'll have a whole bunch of implications that will uh, sp spread from there. In the workplace, of course, uh, it'll uh, have a huge impact on victims' ability to perform their job. Uh, even a, you know, sort of subtle sexual harassment will impair uh, concentration and may impair judgment. Other symptoms that can uh, manifest are low motivation, often uh, perhaps being late or absent from work. It'll affect uh, teams' ability to do their job together. Sometimes you'll have to get other people completing jobs, so there'll be huge costs to organizations uh, in terms of managing uh, the impacts on the victim and the people surrounding the victim. The victims themselves, I should also point, often experience uh, symptoms that are very similar to other uh, forms of trauma like rape or assault. They can feel helpless, afraid, angry, anxious, and depressed. They can manifest physical symptoms such as gastrointestinal problems, eating disorders, insomnia, and this is true whether or not they file a complaint. Certainly seems like uh, the ripple effect uh, of of these actions is so significant. Um, you made mention earlier to, uh, you know, the fact that we we can't really just stand by and watch this happen. And so I wonder if maybe you could comment on beyond what the law says we have to do, but more from a societal sociological perspective. What what can we do about this? How can we respond to these types of actions? Well, I think there's <clears throat> there's a few things that we can do. I think, first of all, there's an, uh, it's incumbent amongst leaders and organizations, uh, and this could be formal leaders such as supervisors and leaders of organizations or informal leaders uh, in organizations, to, to really take uh, a role in terms of making a change in, terms, in the culture and uh, making clear that sexual harassment is not acceptable. Leaders can monitor their own behavior, uh, how they... Uh, how might their words and actions be interpreted? 
And I want to be clear that this is not about political correctness. Uh, I really hate that term. It's really about respect. We need to think, change the language here, that it's really about establishing um, settings, contexts of respect and equality for everyone rather than trying to be politically correct. Leaders can observe others and respectfully engage those who appear to be engaging in inappropriate behavior by making boundaries very clear and by not inadvertently supporting uh, sexual harassment through, for example, laughing at uh, sexist jokes. Um, and again, helping create uh, uh, education uh, initiatives that will help everyone understand um, that it's inappropriate behavior. Men in particular, as I said before, and I think uh, Tracy and Angus are gonna talk about this some more, need to sort of step into the silence and uh, speak up against sexual harassment. The research suggests that only 1% of men are really chronic harassers. So that means the majority are often sort of imp uh, quietly complicit in sexual harassment by not saying anything about it. And men need to be encouraged to sort of take a, lo a role in saying that this is inappropriate. Um, and this can happen in many different ways. You can uh, actually, if it's safe to do so, is approach the person and be direct about what you've seen and what you've heard. But it's also important to avoid making judgments about the individual as a human being, as a person. So what we want to do is comment about the behavior, not about the person, and to avoid validating excuses and justifications. Again, we're we want to switch the conversation from one about political correctness to one about respect and equality. You know, I really like that you draw the distinction uh, between respect and political correctness. You know, we, I think everybody can agree that the term political, politically correct can be a bit charged. You know, there's, t generally speaking, people on either side of the fence on whether or not it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. But at the same time, I, I, I don't think anyone would, would disagree or would dispute that being respectful is, is a pretty good baseline to start with. And so when we're talking about, uh, you know, dealing with victims and how we help victims recovering from sexual harassment and sexual assault, coming at it from that basis of respect is, I think, really important. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. I, you know, in my work as a psychologist and in working with um, offenders as well across a number of different contexts, when I ask people about the value system that they hold. Most people, uh, and I would say 99% of the population, most offenders would agree that respect and equality are important values that they hold. So what we want to do is we want to encourage everybody to live up to the values that we hold as, as a society and as a community and challenge uh, the ways in which we sort of um, give ourselves permission to violate those values. So. Fundamentally, when we uh, build uh, respectful contexts uh, and environments, we're actually supporting everyone. And most people will get that when they're approached properly uh, about these things. I should say one of the things when we're working with those who perpetrate this type of behavior is not to get caught up in giving them their due, giving them the same kind of behavior that they're engaging with others. And that's a common mistake when especially men try to approach other men. They want to sort of shame them or harass them into compliance. And that's, you know, not appropriate. One of the ways that harassment works and violence works is through sort of a dehumanization process, right, where we dehumanize the other through sexual means or other means. And that is what, one of the ways in which we allow ourselves to sort of violate our values by dehumanizing others. Dehumanizing the offender doesn't do anything to change the offending behavior. It actually perpetuates the same problem that we're trying to stop. So what we want to do is be very clear and have very clear boundaries about behavior, but also approach the person uh, from a human perspective, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's uh, we so often hear the expression "eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth," and and people will often retaliate with comparable behavior. But it's really interesting to hear that it's so counterproductive, particularly as it results as it relates to sexual harassment and sexual assault. 
you made uh, you made you've made reference to perpetrators, and I know that you've worked with um, offenders and perpetrators of sexual assault. Can you can you talk a little bit about the type of work that you do with offenders and perpetrators of this type of behavior? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go into too much of the clinical work here, but with most men, a lot of men, sometimes men actually aren't aware that they're being offensive. And again, intent doesn't change the fact that uh, they have engaged in offensive behavior. So sometimes education uh, is really important, and that really helps um, <clears throat> create a shift in a person, especially if you're inviting them to be their best self. Uh, mo with most men, it helps to reconnect them with their values and to help them see how this behavior violates their own value system. It inviting them to become part of the solution rather than seeing themselves only as part of the problem, I think is critical to the work. With severe repeat offenders, uh, sanctions and group norms are most effective. Uh, contrary to popular belief, changing people's behaviors often precedes changing their attitudes. So in environments that do not tolerate inequality and acts of harassment, uh, and that engender respect and equality, they'll more likely move those individuals as well as those repeat uh, more hostile people towards uh, changing how they see the world. Uh, helping people take responsibility is also important, and apologies help both the victim and the offender. In one case I was involved in, in a workplace, when the offending party actually took responsibility and apologized they actually um, uh, made some significant changes in the way they approached the workplace. And the person who was victimized, um, who I also work with, recovered much more quickly from that event. In fact, was able to move back into uh, her full work and duties very comfortably quickly after that. In another case where the person was minimizing the harassment and trying to sort of um, frame it as one of uh, friendship, uh, that uh, the person who was victimized suffered a significantly greater n m uh, number of symptoms and had a harder time returning to work. So responsibility mm -hmm. is critical. Helping people take responsibility is an important part of the treatment. It's it's really interesting that you made reference to, um, uh, for, for lack of a better way of saying it, tapping into the value system of each individual in order to um, illustrate the appropriateness or inappropriateness of the actions. Um, I think that's going to be something that really resonates with the people listening today. Um, you made reference as well to you know, education, how education is such a huge piece of this. And, and perhaps you could talk a little bit more about what other resources might exist that would be useful to people listening today. Um, sure. Uh, before I do that, actually, I, I did want to make a comment about those who were victimized. Um, and uh, I want to make clear that trauma experiences are also disorders of recovery as much as they are of the trauma itself. In other words, it's the silencing and isolation that comes with victimization that contributes the negative long-term impacts of traumatic experiences. So I, I want to make it clear again that we really need to break the silence around sexual harassment, and that's significant uh, to helping those who are victimized uh, overcome the trauma itself. Um, and, Absolutely. of course, counseling and support uh, can be critical, and the more quickly that one has access to it, uh, the more effective it can be as well, uh, more quickly. Uh, and just another quick comment on education. Um, the other term that I don't like is sensitivity training. Uh, again, sensitivity suggests that maybe some people are being too sensitive and some people are not sensitive enough. And again, we need to frame the dialogue, one, in terms of respect and equality rather than sensitivity. Uh, in terms of resources, um, I think first one can start with oneself, so we should all start with ourselves and really ask ourselves some questions, like would I want my daughter, wife, sister, son, brother, husband uh, subjected to this behavior? You know, is this behavior likely to intimidate or belittle the recipient? Is it possible that it might be misinterpreted? So we should ask ourselves some specific questions so that we are taking responsibility for how we're, um, how we're speaking and communicating with others. Um, with respect to other resources, uh, in any organization or many organizations, you can start with your employee family assistance programs. Um, 
Often they will have other resources in which to connect you with. Uh, every province has psychological associations in which uh, you can find a psychologist who specializes in dealing with sexual harassment or abuse issues. Uh, contacting that association will uh, often lead to uh, referrals. And uh, the Canadian Resource Centre for Victims of Crime has many links that can be helpful, including some services for men and some services that are around prevention work. Um, the website there is uh, www.crcbc.ca, and I'm sure that uh, Tracy will have some other resources that she can uh, suggest as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Stefanakis. Um, you know, your the importance that you've put on starting with ourselves, um, I think, is an excellent segue into uh, talking with Tracy Porteous and Angus Reed. And uh, so, turning now to them, I understand that the Ending Violence Association and the BC Lions Club have teamed up on a what I would consider to be a groundbreaking initiative to address the prevalence of sexual harassment and sexual assault. Maybe uh, you could speak, Tracy and Angus, to what is the Be More Than a Bystander program? Sure. I'm very happy to. And I just want to also thank the Canadian Bar Association for taking this issue on in the way that you have, because I think that sexual assault and sexual harassment uh, thrives uh, in the silence of uh, most people in society who don't know what to say and don't know what to do if they see this kind of behavior or these kinds of attitudes happening around them. And, and, it, and it's based on that reality um, is, you know, as Harry so beautifully spoke about the harm that is caused for people who are victimized in these ways um, and harm that can last a lifetime um, can manifest in uh, cancer and heart disease and autoimmune diseases and really undermines one's enjoyment of life and liberties. And, and there are simple things that people who may not be uh, the person doing the harm or may not be the person that has been harmed, there are simple things that people can do that can make the world a difference. So aside from the harm that is caused by, um, from, from experiencing sexual harassment and sexual assault, there's another whole layer of harm um, when people around who know about it are silent. And uh, from working with uh, survivors uh, over a great many years, I can say that um, one of the greatest things we as a community or as a family or as a workplace can offer um, is, is, to, is to break the silence, is to, is to no longer allow this issue to thrive in the silence. And so um, the Anti-Violence Association of BC went to the BC Lions about six years ago and had this idea that we would um, not only try to break the silence surrounding this kind of gender-based violence, but we would have men uh, lead the conversation with other boys and men because that's a piece of the puzzle that has been missing all this time. Women and feminists for the last 40 years have been uh, producing uh, legal analysis and creating programs and responses and uh, creating different kinds of legislation and social policy. Um, and we've moved the dial a great amount um, over these last four decades, um, but we haven't been able to reach men and boys. And there's a, there's a, a PhD women's studies uh, fellow, one of the first fellows, I think, in the U.S. that got a PhD in women's studies by the name of Jackson Katz, and he was an all-star football player when he was in university. And he started this concept of uh, bystander education and reaching men and boys to, to give them skills and confidence um, and help them see that it's partly their role uh, to do something about this violence because in their silence, it's like saying it's okay. It certainly seems yeah, Tracy. like they're... Sorry, go ahead, Angus. No, I, I was just going to follow up on, on what Tracy what Tracy has outlined so gracefully there. In terms of the program, from our perspective, uh, again, following up on Tracy, it's, it's been able to address the issue to students from men, coming in as men and addressing the issue, which I think everyone will agree hasn't really been done before to any great scale. And so it's a two-part two program where, one, we address the issue, we show the reality of it, 
So there's no more denying how real this is. We go over the complete spectrum of abuse so we understand how this can, how this can begin in terms of language, humor, and music, and escalate the way to, to the ultimate extremes. But I think even more importantly after addressing it, we then make it an empowerment program where you know, every great leader has to have knowledge of the issue and the correct and amount of tools in their toolbox needed to, to, to work on it and, and solve it and create a better place. So we then move into empowering the students with things that they can do about this now that we've, now that we've brought it out to reality. And so you know, you, you, you're engaging them to, to actively know their environment, to see what's going on so they can no longer deny the reality, and then empower them with things that they can do how every single student can become a leader and start taking care of the people around them with, with positive things that they will be able to take away and do. That's uh, absolutely true in the sense that, you know, as we've said and heard so many times already today, it really is about starting with ourselves. And maybe, Angus, you could talk a little bit about what, what makes violence against women a men's issue. Well, sure. I think it's already been discussed that I believe the stat was only 1% of men statistically are abusive. But the reality is most people that are being abused happen from men. So the majority of the time, it's a male that is, is in, the abusive, uh, in the abusive stance. And so, you know, for years, and Tracy has discussed, you know, four decades or whatever it may be, or even longer all the way back, where women have had to fight up against this. And really all you're causing is an us versus you mentality where the men would all bind together now. And, and, and no, this is, this is a man's thing. We, we do this. We work. We, we, you know, we're going to fight back. And I think it's important now where men look at each other and say, listen, this is the reality. We are the ones doing this. We are the ones that need to begin to solve this, change this, and create a difference because it, it's, it's, it's happening from our side. And, and I think it needed men to discuss it to men because forever, as we all know, when it's coming from women against men, you create an us versus you mentality and the friction remains. And when you have men now, particularly it's worked out well, where you've got football players, which have historically been seen as the ultimate in terms of a macho male persona coming in and addressing it, and we are the ones saying, listen, this is a real problem. We've, we are acknowledging it. It's had a tremendous impact on the, young, on the young today that would look up to us in terms of that's what an alpha male should be. And we need to say, okay, great. This is what we're talking about. This is what we see as wrong. This is what we need to change if we are going to be uh, uh, good leaders in our community, uh, good friends, good classmates, good teammates, and, and people that are out here to make this world better and safer for everyone. You know, it, you you make reference to the fact that we are all part of this. We're all part of the same society, the same community, and so we are all inherently a part of the solution. So perhaps both of you can speak to what we, me, you, everyone, uh, can do to be more than just a bystander in our own lives, in our workplaces, as an employer, as a lawyer, as a member of the community, as a member of a church, whatever it is. How can we step up? Up and be more than a bystander. Um, I'll, I'll just jump in there first and, and just say that uh, you know it's th this concept is similar to what happened about 30 years ago when people started stepping in uh, when they saw their friends having too much to drink at a party and saying you're too you know you, you, it's not safe for you to drive home like that and I'm going to take your keys. Um, we've also done the same thing in terms of moving the. Um, social dynamics around uh, smoking and uh, wearing seat belts. And so we, um, we, what, we, what we're saying is that speaking up and saying anything, doing anything is better than saying nothing. Um, so for lawyers, for example, and I think that lawyers more than anybody else may be privy to abusive dynamics going on uh, in the context of uh, separation or custody battles, and quite likely um, may be uh, witnessing uh, someone, a male, who might be accused of domestic violence or sexual harassment or sexual assault, 
saying um, or portraying abusive attitudes uh, and behaviors towards women in general or towards uh, somebody that they victimized. And um, I think it's incumbent upon all of us, and lawyers in particular, um, to figure out ways that you can do your job with your client, but at the same time be able to say, you know, um, I, I need to keep this space and the way that we work together respectful towards all the people that we're dealing with. And the kinds of things that you're talking about um, sound um, like they're not that respectful to me. And so you could say things like that. If you're in a courtroom, for example, um, and, I, and I've seen this a lot, and I'm sure many lawyers who are practicing uh, litigants or, or litigators see this, People um, behaving badly in the hallway, um, guys might be uh, being abusive towards their girlfriends. Uh, there's something that we, called, uh, we call offering our presence. And you could simply, it could be as simply as just going and standing next to uh, somebody who, where there's abuse, an abusive dynamic going on. Or interrupting uh, the, the abuser and asking that person for the time or asking the uh, person that's being victimized for the time. It's like changing the dynamic, trying to interrupt the abuse that's going on. Um, you know, saying, not demonizing, and, 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 and what we're trying to do, and we're teaching kids and community members, as you say, church groups and trade unions, to, to figure out ways of having conversations at the workplace and with colleagues and with other members of the community by not demonizing the person that is uh, guilty of the harassment or the abusive behavior, because I think what we all want is that for that person's behavior to change. Um, we know that the um, phenomenon of violence against women, including sexual harassment and abuse, is something that will tend to continue if it's not interrupted. And so be able, to be able to reach out to um, a fellow that might be uh, being abusive or portraying abusive attitudes to say, you know, can we, can we talk about what you've just said or what you've just expressed because it feels abusive to me and I wonder if we can get you some help. You know, it, a couple of things that you said I think will really resonate with people, and one is that we kind of all tend to move through our worlds with our hats on, whatever that hat is for that particular moment or that day, and uh, we tend to live by the boundaries of those hats sometimes. So if I'm a lawyer helping someone with their divorce, that's how I think of my role, and I don't stray outside those boundaries. Um, when really what you're saying is there are no boundaries on some level to the rules as it relates to our obligations to correct this type of behavior. And we all have an opportunity, if not an obligation, to, to step up and take responsibility for it. And I think the second piece that will really resonate with people is that that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be confrontational or combative. Uh, I love the example that you gave about simply asking for the time, just breaking that stream of consciousness that is existing at that time can be sufficient to to stop that behavior and and move people forward. Angus, your involvement and the involvement of the BC Lions Club is particularly interesting given that sports franchises across North America have been associated with sexual harassment and sexual assault in various forms. How has the program affected the culture of the BC Lions Club since this partnership began? It's, a, it's affected it massively. I, I can tell you, um, as most sports programs, we have been involved in, in various school initiatives for years, and most of them have revolved around uh, literacy or health and fitness. And when this program was brought to us uh, quite a few years ago, when we went through the training of it, it, it really rocked, I think, the, the foundation of the way a lot of our players had, had thought, had previously, uh, you know, had their mind made up on, on what was right and what was wrong and what was okay and what was justifiable. And we went through the full training, which was very intense by Dr. Katz. And I, and I tell you, it changed most of our mindsets almost immediately and all of our mindsets over the, the, the finishing of the program. And, you know, we had a core group of, I want to say, about 10 to 12 uh, leaders in the team that went about embarking on the initial phase of this program and off we went to the schools and every time we did it we learned so much more and we kept bringing it back into our locker room and as anyone could imagine a locker room with 50 or so uh, alpha males surrounded only by each other for six hours every day with 
with no women present in the workplace, the, the, the language that was considered acceptable and the humor that was considered funny and the musical lyrics that were sung along to without much other thought could be quite horrendous from view from an outsider. And once we, once we had acknowledged the realities of the situation and stood up and became leaders in, in this field and spokespersons, shall we say, uh, that no longer became acceptable because now we were aware of, of the real issues and we had now begun digging into tools that we could do to become bystanders ourselves and, and become uh, role models for, 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 for the younger generation of how to go about this. And now we were faced with the reality of doing it. And, and you saw that uh, various guys in our group now would, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't hear these things now, this, this language or this humor, and, and not speak up and, and find creative ways that, that each person was comfortable with, depending on who they were dealing with, of, of addressing the issue. And telling them, hey, that you can't, you know, that's not going to be acceptable on this team or guys, we can't have that music playing anymore. Or, you know, that that humor, that's just not funny. And, you know, we're talking about uh, our, our league all star MVP quarterback, Travis Lule, being involved in initiative. So he's a team leader. Myself, who was a, a six time team captain, you know, we had influential people that were now no longer allowing this to be acceptable. And that started to trickle down and, and slowly all that noise just got turned down and, and, and people realized this just because it was acceptable or, or shall I say was never addressed, didn't ever make it right. It doesn't mean it can always keep going on. And so we were able to sort of break it, the conversation. And let's be honest. I mean, it, nothing happens overnight. It's not like a light switch and everything it became great, but you've seen it more of a, I should say a dial than a switch and the noise and all of it has just been, been turned down over the years now to the point that you are the awkward one if you speak like that or, or try to bring that uh, that type of humor or that music because now it's spread into our entire culture of the team that this isn't right and this is not how we do things and this is not acceptable and it gets crushed pretty quickly to the point that uh, you know in a locker room today in, in the BC Lions uh, it would be extremely rare to hear that type of language or, or that type of humor. And I think it would be addressed right away and it would not linger to, to anything that would keep going. And I'll be honest, you know, I grew up playing football since I was a little guy and been around sports my entire life. I never thought I would see a day where a locker room uh, where there was respectful conversation and, and, and respectful humor, if you will, and literally and, and, and see a change uh, this quickly. I, I've been pleasantly shocked. Tracy here, Heidi. I wonder if I also might just share a small anecdote um, in relation to your question in terms of changing the culture within the BC Lions itself. Um, there, we have a, we've had the pleasure of working with about six different spokespeople, spokesmen, and Angus being one of them. And one of the things that I was astounded by is, first of all, 70% of Canadians say that they know a woman who has experienced either sexual assault or abuse in her relationships. And so the BC Lions are no different than the general population. Guys in the locker room will know women who have experienced this. Um, and guys in the locker room are no different from the guys that Harry was talking about a little bit earlier, where there's that te the tendency for a group mentality. And so if the group, the leader, if the leader in the group is somebody who's espousing things that are sexualizing of women, people can tend to go along with that. If the leader of the group is somebody who's not going to accept that kind of sexualizing and disrespect, the group tends to go along with that. And after the program began and the next season that the guys were in the locker room, you know, playing football, and there might have been some, you know, sexualizing uh, comments of women happening in the locker room, um, the guys shared with me is they suddenly, you know, kind of stopped in their tracks and kind of said, oh, my God, we have to say something. We can no longer accept this, these kinds of comments happening around us in our lone locker room. And Travis, who's the quarterback, um, spoke up and said, hey, hey, man, like, you know, we have to be more than bystanders. And our team is committed to this program where we're teaching people how to speak up about this. We can't allow this to go on. And he was backed up by some of the other spokesmen players in the locker room. And from what I understand is the locker room chatter has, has, has done about a 180-degree turn. You know, it's, it certainly goes to show the power of leading by example, which I think is on some level the essence of the bystander.
Commander Intervention Training. And so, Tracy, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about what, what you've learned over the last six years that you've been delivering this training and how receptive the public has been to the program in general. I knew when uh, we first sat down with the BC Lions that uh, this program would be big and it would be popular because it has that element of surprise where people don't expect these big alpha males um, who are the sort of ultimate uh, um, image of masculinity in our society. I knew it would be big, but I had no idea how big and how successful um, it would be. Um, we've reached 86,000 people in person in trainings that the BC Lions have done either at high schools or with Indigenous communities. Uh, one of the spokesmen is uh, J.R. LaRose, who is Indigenous. And so we have communities um, that are First Nations all across B.C. that want J.R. to come and lead this conversation with them. Um, we've been uh, do using the program and its messages uh, a lot on social and mainstream media, and we've been tracking that. And we're close to about 500 million impressions of the message, either on Facebook or Twitter or on bus shelter signage that the City of Vancouver and the City of Surrey, Surrey has given to us. Uh, the program has won numerous awards. Um, the football teams, the CFL teams in Alberta and Manitoba and Ontario have picked it up. And not only that, um, we went to the CFL head office after that terrible video that went viral came out a few years ago of Ray Rice punching his uh, fiance into unconsciousness into an elevator and went to the commissioner of the CFL and said, you know, um, there's five teams now in the CFL that are doing some iteration of bystander education and uh, using the celebrity of football players to talk to youth about this issue. How about the CFL getting involved? And I, you know, to our great um, surprise uh, and appreciation, the CFL just said immediately, you're right, and we want to do something. And we worked with them over the last uh, year and a half and developed a workplace policy um, nationally that the CFL now has in place um, to ensure that anybody who is harmed in these ways, uh, anybody who is part of the CFL community, will get help. Anybody who's doing the harm will get help. Um, and if those behaviors don't change, the, there will be sanctions. And not only that, we've also just finished training all of the teams across Canada, um, not just the staff, but the players and the coaches. Um, we also um, have just recently made a film of uh, bringing the bystander message into the workplaces of resource extraction communities. And this is another huge undertaking and has the potential, I think, to make huge social change where we're trying to bring this program, which, you know, trying to give everyone permission and encouragement and skills about how to speak up and what to say and what to do if you know violence is going on around you. Um, but uh, to take it to, to male-dominated workplaces in particular, um, I think we have the potential to make great change. So, so what I've learned is that um, there are really no bounds to the importance of, 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 of encouraging people to speak up because, indeed, it's the silence that has got us to this epidemic in the first place, and it's the breaking of that silence that's going to get us out of this. It certainly sounds like the program is moving forward uh, at amazing speed and with a great momentum. Um, do you have specific goals in mind for the future as to as to what you would like to achieve or how you would like it to move forward, maybe perhaps more definitively? Yes. Um, so as I mentioned, we made this film for the um, oil and gas and resource extraction industries, um, and we hope, and we're in dialogue right now with, um, people that are part of the Canadian petroleum industry, um, and there's many different uh, subsidiary companies about taking this program into camps um, where, you know, I guess for lack of a better word, they're sort of captive audiences um, where conversations can happen from a health and safety perspective. Uh, we've also had the pleasure of uh, sitting down with and presenting the program to 
various national and provincial trade unions, some of whom, the, for example, the BC Federation of Labor in BC is supporting the program in terms of our work in schools, but we're also talking to the steelworkers and Unifor and others. Um, and so from a workplace perspective, you know, I mean, there's, there's the kinds of um, sexual harassment that Gail uh, articulated so beautifully earlier in this call. Um, and the other aspect of this kind of violence is that it, 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 for those people that are suffering this at home, it doesn't stay at home when people go to work. And so even if the harassment isn't happening in the workplace, if people are being harmed in their life, um, sexually assaulted in their relationship or harassed or stalked, in their life, the uh, effects of that are brought to work. The vulnerabilities of that person come to work, and that can create vulnerabilities for coworkers. And also for the people that are doing the harm um, that might be obsessed with uh, stalking or harassing people, they can be distracted on the job. And if they're working with heavy equipment, um, if, they're, if their job involves driving a truck or a car, um, uh, you know, I mean, an accident can happen in a second. And so um, the idea of bringing the be more than a bystander concept um, into workplaces along with sexual harassment policies, I think is the way to go. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about where people can find additional resources, whether it be best practices, videos, announcements, or, or even the film that you spoke to? Yes, um, so we, and we also made another film, and I should mention this, uh, our first film in this area is called Be More Than a Bystander, and its audience is targeted more to youth, and um, Shaw Cable has been an incredible supporter of the program since day one, and anybody could see that film if they're within the markets between BC and Manitoba, and they are a Shaw customer they can go to the video on demand section, which is where you usually go to rent movies, um, but type in the word bystander and it comes up for free. Um, if somebody wants to have their own copy of this film, they could certainly uh, buy a copy of that by contacting the Ending Violence Association of BC. Um, on our website, which is simply um, ending, uh, www.endingviolence.org, um, there's a page that has, that's populated with all kinds of ways of how somebody could be more than a bystander in a circumstance where you might be a stranger at a bus stop or at a sports game or at, you know, at a soccer game if you don't know the people. So there's, there's, a, there's a section on our website that's called Be More Than a Bystander. And as I say, there's all kinds of ideas about how people can speak up, whether it's interrupting behavior or talking to somebody who's being abusive or reaching out to somebody who's the target and asking her if she's okay. Um, we also have a YouTube page. Um, so if you go to YouTube and then you type into the search bar, Ending Violence Association of BC, we have uh, many, many, if you, for lack of a better word, at video assets there. Uh, we, in, together in partnership with the BC Lions, have produced many public service announcements, and they're all posted there. We also uh, developed eight vignettes, eight videos, showing how you can be more than a bystander in various circumstances, um, in a university setting, in a in a, at a bus stop, um, in a classroom, at a restaurant, at a bar, just to sort of really tr try to show to people that it's not rocket science, and it's not, as you say, it's not always a conf confrontive thing. Obviously, we want people to be safe and be concerned about their safety first, but I, but I think most people, because we haven't uh, provided an opportunity to have this conversation um, in grade school or at the university level or in workplaces, I think most people just don't know what to say or what to do. And there's a zillion things that people can say and can do that aren't, uh, aren't confrontive. Um, and so, uh, so between our website and um, the YouTube page, there is a lot of really concrete examples of what people can say and do. Excellent. Thank you very much. It is very clear that sexual harassment and sexual assault present more than just legal questions and issues for each of us, but rather they point to what I would call very core societal issues. 
obviously the laws in Canada provide us, and by us I mean employers, employees, and all Canadians for that matter, a structure to better understand what many would consider baseline obligations. But from everything that was said today, it seems to be abundantly clear that we need to do so much more than just follow the letter of the law. We need to be better than what the law requires of us. We need to keep talking about these issues, as complex and as difficult as they might be. And we need to listen to each other. Everyone deserves to be heard. And most importantly, what resonated so clearly for me today is that we need to break this silence. We need to shift this power balance that exists because of silence and take that power back by speaking out and being heard. Most importantly, we need to take a stand. Every single one of us needs to stand up and make it clear that we will no longer stand by and silently let sexual harassment and sexual assault happen. We are not just bystanders. We are all part of this. We're all part of the solution together. If you or someone you know was a victim of sexual harassment or sexual assault, I would encourage you to access the many resources that have been referenced today. Details of where to find those resources and the Canadian Bar Association's Right Your Wrong campaign are provided on the Canadian Bar Association website, which is www.cba.org. I would like to thank all of our speakers today for their time, their passion, and their commitment. Thank you very much.